Good afternoon. I'm John Kaiser. And the title is Bracing for the End Time. And uh, I've been, uh, I-, I was thinking recently about the boomers versus the post boomers, and I realized that uh, in 2020, there are no boomers left who are under the age of 55. And that's a bad thing because in Canada, if uh, you're 55 or older, resource juniors are unsuitable for you. The full service brokers won't even accept an unsolicited order. And the reason is uh, if you pass away, their horrible kids will look at all the losses they suffered in the uh, resource juniors and go to the bank and say, uh, how could you let daddy buy all this uh, resource junior stuff and lose so much money? And so as a preemptive uh, 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 action against this, they kind of like are forcing boomers to go to the discount brokers insofar as they want to uh, trade the resource juniors. Now the post boomers, they don't even know about this space except for a very tiny, tiny percentage. And the reason I'm talking about the end times uh, for this sector is I think the space is dying because the audience is not being regenerated. And much of this talk today is going to be about what needs to be done to bring the post-boomer generations into the resource sector so that this ecosystem, which is an important part of Canada, continues to thrive. And the other thing is uh, the boomers have all the money and the post-boomers don't. And and, And even if they have money, they probably aren't accredited investors. So getting money into the treasuries of these juniors has become a very difficult task. The health of the sector, you'll be familiar with this chart, is terrible. This is the uh, uh, TSX Venture resource listings. There's about just over 1,100 of them. Only 400 of them have more than 200,000 working capital. Half of them have negative working capital, that totals to about $2 billion, that's never going to be repaid. And the ones that do have money, there's about 2.4 billion sitting in the treasuries right now, based on the last uh, quarterly filings. This is a financing activity chart. The red is resource sector financing on the TSX venture. And uh, it's been, uh, except for a little blip in 2016-17, it's been a tough time since uh, that last bull cycle for the juniors, 2009 to 11. We are now in the eighth year of a bear market, and uh, you see a couple blips there on the funding, but those are individual companies that manage to do a very large financing. The majority of companies are having a tough time doing small to medium-sized financings. And this chart is the most depressing of it all. Um, the, uh, the blue is the traded value of the TSX Venture resource listings, and the green is the non-resource listings. And you can see how the uh, uh, non-resource listings now dominate the TSX Venture trading activity. And the, the red and the yellow are simply the percentage, the relative percentage. And you can see these uh, sort of this big down period, a little bit of a hurrah here in 2016-17. And then this here gave me cause for optimism. This, of course, is cannabis and blockchain. Cannabis is now dying, and and this was a part of this trend, and gold started getting the juniors breathing some life, but since uh, September, the last uh, MIF conference, uh, it's it's like it's faded. Even though gold's still 1450, 1500, it's like it's had no impact. And uh, the reason this is now reversing again is because the traded value is, is, is shrinking. Friday, only $9.4 million worth of uh, uh, stock traded amongst those 1,100 resource listings on the TSX venture. That can't sustain the sector. So now I'm going to switch to something I've never really done before in my presentations. I'm going to talk about the, 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 the gap between the boomer generations and the uh, post-boomer generations. And those two little emblems I have at the bottom there, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. Is it growing bigger or is it shrinking on you? And I would say that across the generations, in everybody's mind, it is shrinking. The future is disappearing on us. 
And it is the fact that the post-boomer generation is caught in this same funk, which is really depressing. And uh, I've sort of chosen uh, Donald Trump as the icon for the, uh, 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 the boomer generation. He's amongst the oldest. He was born in 1946. And Greta Thunberg is the symbol for all the uh, future generations. So everybody's probably familiar with the uh, uh, tram philosophy problem. You've got a runaway tram on a track. And uh, standing on that track is, uh, say, in this case, Greta. Uh, there's a switch where that runaway tram can be switched to another track where Donald is, is standing. And so the question is, what do you do? And, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting problem, but in this case, the runaway tram is climate change and what it will do to future generations. And the paradox right now is we don't exactly know what it will do or that anything we do about it will make a difference, but we do know that trying to do something about it will result in sacrifices that will be experienced by the boomer generation, which will probably not live long enough to suffer the consequences of climate change. So you've now got this huge conflict growing between the boomer generation and the post-boomer generation. And this is an intergenerational problem that needs to be resolved. And uh, there is a way to do it. Um, it requires sacrifice from the boomers. Now, in the resource sector, there are ways where you can fight climate change without incurring a sacrifice by you know, getting rid of uh, efficient gasoline cars and getting pain in the butt, uh, electric vehicles. And, uh, and this is something called light weighting. And two metals that I'm pretty enthusiastic about are niobium and scandium. The niobium market's already a $3 billion market, and niobium makes steel stronger, therefore lighter, and anything that moves, well, you save energy by having a niobium alloy in the, in the steel. And a scandium does the same thing for aluminum, but that market's not yet developed. It's a potential market. And so two stocks that are uh, sort of my favorite right now, Niobe Metals, it's working with the Moose Cree First Nation to get a social license from them to develop this in their backyard. And this is something where if they grant this, they're not just helping themselves, they're actually contributing to the world in general because more niobium sources uh, are needed to ensure the stability of niobium supply. In the Scandium International, that's like the ideal stock for post-boomers. Uh, they've been shunned by the boomers in Europe, on Wall Street and Bay Street, and that's a story that younger people could embrace. And the company's now trying to raise money uh, to keep their offtake development building. And so if you're a post-boomer and are interested in that, check it out. Now, the, there's three main spaces in the resource sector that you can focus on. One is gold, which is basically a, a proxy for inflation and uncertainty. Another is copper and all the base metals, which are a proxy for global economic growth. And then there's the exotic security of supply categories, such as uh, cobalt, for electric vehicles where there's new applications or where there's potential for supply disruption. The, for the post-boomer generation, that cobalt category is probably the most interesting. They're not really interested in the copper macroeconomic because the way they see it, the boomers are basically killing the future. So what do they care about you know, macroeconomic growth? It doesn't do much for them. And gold, and this is the thing that annoys me the most. The gold is just ignored as this thing that old people are into and therefore should be shunned by the post-boomers. And I'm going to argue today that that thinking needs to be changed and can be changed. So the three reasons um, why gold could appeal to us, uh, what, what are the reasons? Uh, you know, hedge against fiat currency debasement inflation. Well. That's nonsense, and we don't have inflation. And uh, uh, it's just a mathematical adjustment. You get taxed on the capital gain. Uh, you're not very smart if you own gold just for a, a hedging against inflation because your buying power ends up reduced after tax simply by uh, 
you know, having gold track the inflation rate. The bad thing from the last 30 years has been gold as a channel for right-wing uh, ideology, uh, libertarian thinking, uh, you know, Doug Casey type of stuff. And what hasn't really been emphasized as much is using gold as a hedge against uncertainty. It's the uncertainty about this light at the end of the tunnel that seems to be shrinking rather than growing. That is the key motif that the post-boomer generation need to get their he heads around, and they need to see gold as a way to kind of fight against this end times negativity that pervades the world these days. So th this chart shows you uh, what uh, would have happened in gold in 1935 if they uh, didn't fix it, they let it free float. Inflation adjusted, it would be only $645 today. It's you know, almost three, two, two times, two and a half times that. Why is that? Well, it's not really functioning as an inflation adjustment. It's functioning, it's playing a different role. It's hedging against uncertainty. And it's more linked to prosperity than, than all this other inflation consideration. And this graphic shows that uh, you know, after the big adjustment in the 70s, when gold went from $35 to uh, $850 and then settled back around $400, Inflation adjusted, that's $1,251 today, which is not that far off from 1460, 66, whatever it is today. There's been only a 15 to 20% real price increase in the price of gold. And this is also a problem for the juniors because 3 billion ounces have been mined since 1980, and they've harvested all that low hanging fruit that was put into the money when gold underwent a 400% dramatic repricing in the 70s. So we need gold to go up, not five, 10 times as some of the more histrionic gold bugs say, but simply move into the $2,000 to $3,000 range without inflation, a repricing of an asset class with whose six billion ounces is only worth $9 trillion today, which is uh, half of the $17 trillion parked in bonds that are negative yielding at the moment. So uncertainty, this graphic is, depicts what the uncertainty about the future is all about. It's the emergence of China as a global economic force, eventually uh, a military force to rival the United States, and the relative shrinkage of the global, uh, of, of America's global GDP as part of, America's GDP as part of the global GDP. And that's what's driving this back to America message, uh, the trade wars. It's uh, trying to reverse this trend. And it's bringing in uncertainty across the board. And of course, here's, I'm not going to get into this. I've done this in past conferences. But uh, these are all these trends which are shaping the discourse about the future. The trade war, uh, the collapse of globalized trade, uh, thug culture and populism and authoritarianism, uh, uh, polarization, hyper-surveillance. Uh, in fact, an upcoming election, we've already been told that if the result is not Trump, it's because the deep state has rigged it and it's all fake. So reality is now being distorted into this thing that you, you cannot trust. Uncertainty, is any of this reversible? What can you do about it? Now, I've puzzled why isn't the juniors doing much better? They are the proxy, proxy for gold. Because, you know, gold goes up, that's fine, but you make your money in the juniors. Gold's up to, you know, pretty good from 1100, 1200, where it was not too long ago. But the boomers seem to be shunning gold. And the, the fact is that the, uh, the boomers who have historically liked gold intuitively understand that a thumbs up for gold is a thumbs down for Trump. And so they're conflicted. They don't want to go gung-ho doing something that's at odds with where their allegiances lie. So until Trump is not part of the equation anymore, there's going to be a reluctance amongst the boomers. Now again, for the uh, post-boomers, you look at that one graphic there and you see how much of America's spending goes to the post-boomers and how much goes to the uh, to the boomers. There's an embedded bias against the post-boomers that's setting up this intergenerational conflict. 
And there's a good chance that Elizabeth Warren, with her let's even the playing field policies, could end up being president. And that's not going to change that uh, debt trajectory that you see there under, uh, under Trump's uh, administration. Uh, it's, it's a trillion dollar deficit uh, now and the total debt keeps, keeps climbing. So within a year, the boomer gold bugs may be back in the game. But the trick right now is to swing that other half of the population that sees itself as liberal to embrace gold and say, this, we can own this, we can hedge it. And we also need the post-boomers to start seeing gold as a hedge against all this incredible uncertainty that the uh, boomers are driving for the future. So this chart is meaningless as it is. I've sort of pasted the gold price trend against the uh, GDP and the value of the gold stock uh, trend over time. Doesn't really say anything, but the question is, how do you map the price of gold to this uncertainty? And the key is global prosperity, and the best measure for it is global GDP in nominal terms. So what I've done is I've tracked uh, the amount of gold at the end of each year and uh, multiplied it by the average price of gold during that year, and then divided it by the GDP, the nominal GDP. And you get this interesting chart, and this chart is meaningful because it tracks the world's perception about the uncertainty. And you see that period in the 70s where it goes way up, America's losing it, Tehran, Afghanistan, uh, inflation, uh, OPEC. And then you see that long decline where it becomes a smaller percentage until the China super cycle kicks in and then the financial crisis and all that. And we see this run up where at the peak it's about 14% just uh, over half of what it was during that extreme period of uncertainty during the, uh, the late 70s. And if you take that percentage and uh, apply it to the current situation in the gaps, that $850 gold during that height of uncertainty is equivalent to $3,500 gold. And that's without any inflation. And if you take that sort of 4% low in 2000 when America owned the world and history had ended and, and uh, gold should be just around $500. Where is gold more likely to end up in the future? I would say it's somewhere between that 10% and that 27% of global GDP. And this is assuming that the global economy is not gonna tank and go to nothing. So we have a case for arguing that if uncertainty continues to intensify about what the hell's going on in the world, gold ownership will go up. And because you can't increase the 90 million ounces of new supply uh, overnight, that means the price has to go up. And that's why I think we are on the threshold of a repricing into the $2,000 to $3,000 range. And back to that chart here, that whole run here, this was just an inflation catch-up, and it settled back to be kind of in line. We need to think in terms of the 70s, where yes, there was 10%, 11% inflation, but it was something different that drove the gold price. We are now back in this stage, and we're gonna see gold take off. And when it happens, there'll be no sellers, because everybody will know that we don't know where the world's going. We don't know what stupid things are gonna be done. And so then you get that pricing, that repricing. Now, goes to $2,000, whoop de doo 33% increase. That's of no interest to the post-boomers, even a double to 3,000. But the math underlying the resource juniors, and this is an example from a Midas Gold Stibnite project, the stock's at 50, 60 cents with the numbers they last published, even here, 1450 gold, the projects not really worth developing. But if gold suddenly at $2,000, it clears all the hurdles and you get a four to $7 price range as plausible. So a mere 33% increase in the price of gold has 10 bagger potential for the resource juniors with ounces in the ground. And that's the math, the logic that the post boomers need to discover. They need to understand the leverage that's implicit in a gold price move. They don't have a huge amount of money. They're not gonna buy gold and sit on it. It's only the trust fund babies 
who are going to be parking some of their, or their wealth into, into gold. But the post boomers need to be shown how to do this. And how do you do this? I mean, I do this. It's complicated. You need to understand the discounted cash flow model. You need to understand the, uh, the uncertainty ladder. But the math, the logic is sound, and it can be used to price a potential future outcome based on the stage of uncertainty where it is now. And I did that with Arizona Mining back in uh, 2016 when they started having that discovery, Hermosa Taylor. And it's, it's, it, the, the way it unfolded, it was textbook. It actually became exactly as I predicted. So this method is available to start placing bets on the juniors. Now, why do people bet on these juniors? Uh, well, to make a whole bunch of money, right? Why, why do they uh, think they will? Well, they think they're going to be lucky, maybe. Uh, maybe they think they're smarter than everybody else. Uh, maybe they do more research and they're here at a conference like this, so, so they've uh, got an advantage over everybody. Um, most of the time, they think the trend is their friend. And that's a problem for our sector because we have no trend that is our friend. I mean, a little move in gold, it needs to blast through $2,000 to be that sort of trend that say, hey, this, this is real. But what we have forgotten in this space is that people gamble to be entertained. And it's kind of ironic that we're at this venue which has a casino attached next to it. Uh, so, Bringing entertainment back into this space is really important. And the post-boomers, they want to be entertained. But as part of being entertained, you also want to be effective. You don't want to be just a passive person. You want to be influencing. And that's what the post-boomers are all about. They want to be engaged. They want to be making a difference, even if it's a subtle difference. And we need, need to make this space accessible to them in those terms. And what is the main marketing method? It's push, push, push. Everything is just pushed at people. We need to go more into pull marketing. Conferences like this are a type of pull because it's you going up to the company, uh, looking people in the eye, uh, asking questions, and trying to pick up something that's uh, interesting. Uh, um, one-on-one -on -one engagement, talking with uh, the CEO or, or, or IR, all of those are more of a pull type of marketing. But all these things that exist now, they're not enough. And that's why four years ago, I was able to convince Andy Gregg, uh, the uh, former head of uh, Bechtel's Global Mining Rule, uh, Unit, uh, to bankroll the Share Collective, which is actually an online platform that has all the underlying math for that discounted cash flow model and, and all the, uh, you know, what, what stage it's at. And, generates uh, graphics like this one over, over here, which you can use to sort of see how's the market pricing it, what's the favorite outcome, what would happen if it starts to become reality. We need this type of interpretative framework available to uh, get people, even the boomers, engaged because the dirty truth is most boomers themselves don't know how to do the underlying math for pricing and expiration play. And this thing, they messed it up. Uh, uh, they, they, they haven't yet built what I wanted them to build, but they uh, uh, redid it in the past year. And they're now on the threshold uh, building the stadium, the arena, which allows the members to be seated and be, see themselves and be seen by everybody else. And this is the key to getting the post-boomers engaged. Uh, this whole system makes it easy to learn how does mining work? It's a forum which is highly contextualized. Uh, it, it's not just pumping and bashing on Stockhouse or, or hot copper. And because you get seated in there based on the reputation that you evolve, uh, uh, you can actually influence the behavior of everybody. And it becomes entertaining because you, instead of like wasting your time with some first shooter video game, uh, you go into the uh, uh, onto this site and you start researching and you visit all these uh, planets that have been colonized by individuals who are there and able to be seen and they can comment and they can argue about how big is the size of the prize um, and uh, what's going to happen next. So right now, you come to a conference like that and you listen to, you know, 
10, 15 companies and you go home and your head hurts and, uh, and it all disappears and, and you are as ignorant uh, afterwards as you were before, except if you come away with, I'm going to buy this stock. Uh, but then maybe the next morning uh, something else distracts you. We need to create a greater stickiness in the audiences with regard to what the potential is. And the companies are not allowed to be forward-looking until they've spent millions and years delivering a PEA. They can't tell you what they do as back-of-the-napkin uh, economic geology uh, internally. They can't share that. So the crowd has to be empowered to do this and share it in a public space. And they're not allowed to be John Kaiser, because that's a real person who is uh, trusted. They all have to be, say, JK, an untrusted predator who you cannot trust until through your activity you've demonstrated that you actually are a trustworthy person. So this chair collective will eventually evolve into a uh, community uh, where gamblers from around the world will flock to it, They'll find which planets or projects have the most activity. They can check the math and see uh, you know, what the story is. Is this thing overpriced, underpriced? Uh, uh, but most importantly, they're not just betting on the fundamental outcome, which this space is basically reduced to. They're also going to be able to bet on crowd behavior. So you'll see clans sitting there. You know, There's the red ones uh, who are hostiles, the green ones who are uh, friendlies, and they will start to have these networks and they'll go to war against each other and entertainment becomes like a mass distributed gaming environment, except it's not meaningless like all those other games that the post boomers are into. It actually maps to the fundamental real world ecosystem of exploring for minerals and changing the wealth of the world. It's not just a wealth transfer system. That's why I think the uh, resource juniors uh, if the a sector needs to be saved, and it has to be by bringing the post-boomers in in a manner like this, and at the same time, enable the boomers to feel smart when they wander into this space. So the size of the prize, you know, um, speculation that's, that enables uh, one to uh, see how big it is and what a fair price should be, and be able to map it to the results and then watch how others are trading and be able to visibly agree or disagree with the way the crowd is behaving, that type of future is available. It is being built. Hopefully in a year, uh, this thing will be rolled out. And companies like Nevada Exploration, which is the first in my session, you can see where, uh, you know, if they find a 5 million ounce Cortez Hills clone, what the impact would be down the road and what it would also be during the interim. And uh, for the post-boomers, uh, going to places like Nevada, uh, Canada, sort of back to safer jurisdictions where there are meaningful environmental rules to get stuff developed, that's also something that the post-boomers who are trained to be hostile towards mining need to understand. We can't let them get away with saying, it's not going to happen in my backyard while they use their cell phone We're made from stuff mined in China where the victims downstream and this thug dictatorship uh, have no say at all. The post-boomers can't be let to get away with simply dumping the cost into somebody else's backyard. And uh, that wraps up uh, my presentation. Uh, this is the price structure right now. It will change at the end of the year. I may even shut it down for a, for, for a brief period while I rebuild the website. Uh, I'll still be doing what I regularly do, but if you want to get on board ahead of this uh, you know, takeoff that I think will happen in the new year, do so before the end of the year. Thank you.